Good morning. And I pray once again that the Lord is blessing you and, and all of your family. Hey, if you're a visitor and you've been joining us online for these services, I pray that you would consider joining us in person uh, whenever you're ready, whenever you feel like it's safe. I will tell uh, everyone that we're continuing to take precautions. We're taking safeguards like social distancing and doors left open for you and wearing masks as we move about. So I just uh, would ask you to consider uh, coming out uh, when you're ready and worshiping with us. And again, if you like these videos, uh, share them uh, with your friends and with your family. Uh, that would be great. Uh, it just gets the word out. It, it helps you share the gospel with others. I want to ask you to keep a praying church. Pray for a Holy Spirit revival in, in our churches and in our community like I, like I suggested last week. I sincerely believe that's really the only thing that's going to, to bring the healing that we need as a nation. Well, I'd like to call us to worship this morning with Psalm 96, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 96, verses 1 to 6. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, you are indeed great and greatly to be praised. You are holy and righteous and deserving of all glory and honor. And even after we've given you our greatest praise, Lord, even then it is not enough. Lord, you are holy and we are not. We have fallen far short of your glory. No one is righteous, Lord, not even one. So we confess again our sins and we rely upon your amazing grace in Jesus. Oh Lord, forgive us, not according to our iniquities, but according to your steadfast love in Christ. Cleanse us, renew us, change our hearts, O oh God. Change our churches, change our nation. Humble us, O oh Lord, help us understand that you are our only hope. Help us see our brokenness in light of your holiness. And help us understand that apart from your atoning sacrifice in Jesus, we are completely lost. Lord, please stir our hearts. Send your Holy Spirit to convict us and draw us unto you. Lord, we pray for physical healing this morning. Heal our loved ones and friends. Heal our afflictions. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, today we're continuing in uh, this great book of Nehemiah. We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 6. And I'm just going to read verses 15 uh, to 19 today. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul, in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, 
the son of Era, and his son Jehohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in my presence, and reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. Nehemiah had come to Jerusalem from Susa with the, with the objective to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And along the way, he encountered many obstacles. His very first obstacle was that he had to get permission from King Artaxerxes, the very same king who earlier had forbidden the rebuilding of Jerusalem and its walls. Of course, we've seen over the past few weeks that Sambalot and Tobiah and others were seeking to stand in his way. They've opposed Nehemiah and his team with ridicule and a threat of violence. They oppose him with deception and distraction, with rumors and gossip and with intimidation. Nehemiah also faced opposition from within. The tribe of Judah began to question whether or not they had the strength, whether or not they had enough people to rebuild the wall. Some of the wealthier Jews also were, were weakening the morale of Nehemiah's workers by charging them exorbitant interests. Nehemiah was opposed throughout the process, but he pressed on. Therefore, as I said last week, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 may be the biggest understatement in this book. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month Elul in 52 days. According to Nehemiah 1.1, Nehemiah first heard of the need to rebuild the wall in the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign in the month of Kislev. And that would have been around November or December time frame of 444 B.C. And then he didn't have the opposition to talk to Artaxerxes to, to get his permission until the month of Nisan, which would have been around March or April of 445 B.C. And then Nehemiah had to travel from Susa to Jerusalem, which would have taken him another two to three months. So Nehemiah and his team likely started on the wall at the beginning of August 445 B.C., and they finish before the end of September. Less than two months, 52 days of actual construction. So we're talking 10 months or less from conception to completion. Four to five months planning and waiting for an opportunity to speak to Artaxerxes. Two to three months travel and then less than two months of actual construction. Ten months all total. Fifty-two days of construction to rebuild a wall that it places was 40 feet high, eight feet thick, and it was two to two and a half miles in length. Can you imagine the fanfare that would take place today if a leader completed a project like this in less than ten months? But the Bible simply states so the wall was finished in 52 days. No fanfare. And what was so impressive was the humility of Nehemiah. Look at verse 16. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. The physical accomplishment was so amazing that the people couldn't help but see, even the enemies of Nehemiah couldn't help but see that God had helped them rebuild the wall. However, I also can't help but think that Nehemiah's humility played a part in everyone seeing the hand of God throughout this project. For along the way, and Nehemiah made it clear that God's hand was guiding him, and God was doing this mighty work. Chapter 1, Nehemiah fervently prayed to God day and night, and he sought God's favor. 
Chapter 2, when he was seeking King Artaxerxes' favor, Nehemiah whispered prayers. Later in chapter 2, when he told everyone of his calling to rebuild the Jerusalem wall and he was first opposed, Nehemiah declared, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. When he faced opposition in chapter 4, Nehemiah prayed and the people prayed while they set a guard. Nehemiah's enemies even saw that God had frustrated their plan. And Nehemiah declared to the people, our God will fight for us. In chapter 5, when the wealthy Jews were oppressing the poor Jews, Nehemiah rebuked them based on the teaching of God's law. Nehemiah exhorted the people to stop charging interest, and he set the example by stopping charging interest himself. And he urged them all to do so out of fear, out of reverence for the Lord. In the first part of chapter 6, when tempted to enter the inner portions of the temple, Nehemiah saw through the deception, and he would not break the command of God and enter the inner portions. He relied upon God to deal with the likes of Tobiah and Sanballat. Through the whole process, Nehemiah made it clear who was in charge, who was to receive the glory, and it wasn't Nehemiah. It was God who had done this mighty work. The people couldn't help but perceive that God had helped Nehemiah for over and over again. Nehemiah acknowledged and he glorified God. So here when the project was over, well, he wasn't about to try to steal God's glory. He just humbly records that the project was completed and even his enemies perceived that God had helped them. It was his humble way of recording to God be the glory. You know, quite a few people will acknowledge God when they're on their way up to the ladder, up the ladder of success. They'll, of course, even pray to God, asking him to give them success. But it's amazing that once they reach the pinnacle, they sometimes forget God and, and act as if the success is all theirs, that it's their exclusive achievement. But not Nehemiah. He remembered God. Therefore, we'll see that God wasn't finished with Nehemiah. Nehemiah had been faithful in rebuilding the wall and he'd been humble about it. Therefore, God is going to have more work for Nehemiah to do. And that's because he gave God the glory. Because he was humble. Because he gave God the glory, Nehemiah would also help reform Israel spiritually. Nehemiah was a humble leader, a rare breed, really. Gordon MacDonald, in his book, A Resilient Life, tells about a time when he and his wife got to work on a habitat home for humanity in Hungary. Former President Jimmy Carter and his wife Rosalind were assigned to the house being built right next to the one Gordon and his wife were working on. And he said it gave me a chance to kind of glance over every once in a while and see what the former president was doing. And one might have expected him to take special privileges. But Gordon McDonald reports that such was not the case. President Carter never seemed to stop working. He made it clear to fellow construction workers that he was there to work and he would not have time to visit with what you might call rubberneckers. If people desired to take pictures with him, that, he said, would have to wait until the project was finished. At mealtime, everyone gathered in a huge feeding tent and President Carter always took a place near the end of the food line. He used the same portable bathrooms that everyone else used. He endured the same housing that everyone else stayed in. Throughout the week, it was clear 
that he resisted any special privileges to which he might have otherwise been entitled. Such humility is rarely seen among politicians. Perhaps it didn't make him the best president. I, I don't know. I'll let you decide that. But I can tell you this. It has made President Carter the kind of man whom God continues to use. Christian leaders, like President Carter, like Nehemiah, we must trim our egos. We must humble ourselves. We must give God the glory. And the issue of our own egos can be a huge struggle. Look at the Bible and even a quick glance reveals men whose egos had to be purified. Moses grew up in the home of Pharaoh. You can bet he had some ego issues. David's ego and sense of greatness was part of his downfall with Bathsheba. You can tell that the Apostle Paul, when he was a Pharisee, he boasts of his accomplishments. And in his arrogance, he seemed to have thought that he had the right to persecute Christians. So what made the difference for these guys? What, what changed them? What humbled them? I would argue that at least in part, they got a sense of God's holiness in comparison with their unholiness. Moses encountered God in the burning bush in Exodus 3. And God even told him that he was standing on holy ground. David, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, was rebuked by the prophet Nathan, and he repented. And we have his prayer as Psalm 51. And there over and over again, David asked God to wash him and cleanse him, to create in him a clean heart. David recognized that God is holy, but he, David, was far, far from being holy. And so his only hope was to be cleansed by God. The Apostle Paul, in his arrogance and in his zeal as a Pharisee, was ravaging the early church. He was going from house to house and he was dragging believers off to prison. But then he encountered the risen Lord as a great light. And Paul, then named Saul, fell to the ground and was blinded. He had encountered God's chosen one, the Holy One, and he was forever changed. It so humbled Paul that he later said that he counted all his accomplishments as a Pharisee as nothing more than rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. You see, some of the greatest leaders in the Bible had to be humbled before they were fit for service in God's kingdom. In Nehemiah, he built the wall and God continued to use Nehemiah to bring reforms to the Israelites because Nehemiah acknowledged God. Nehemiah humbled himself and he gave God all the glory. And I would argue that to do so, Nehemiah must have also had a sense of God's holiness and his own unholiness. I think one of the reasons our egos run wild is that we've lost a sense of how unholy we are compared to God's holiness. Folks, God is sinless. He is free from all imperfections. God is without error. God is without fault. God is pure. And such things cannot be said about any of us. God is set apart and distinct from everything and everyone in our fallen world. And that ought to humble us. Isaiah 57, 15 says this, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You see, God is high and lifted up. Only he inhabits eternity. His very name is holy. He's called El Kadosh, the Holy One in Hebrew. 
Continue on in verse 15. The Holy One says, I dwell in the high and holy place. You see, God is holy. He's so holy that he dwells in a high and a holy place separate from all our sin. But Isaiah 57, 15 doesn't end there. God also dwells with him or her who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. The Holy One dwells with those who will humble themselves. The Holy One, God, who is pure. And we are not. And yet, He seeks after us and He revives us. And He did so through Jesus. In God's holiness, He has reason to discard us for we are anything but holy. But God's holiness is rooted in his love for us, and thus he saved us. One of the ways you and I can trim our ego, leaders, and continue to be the kind of leaders God seeks, is to remind ourselves that God is holy and we are not. In fact, we are totally broken. No one is righteous, not even one. And so we need to meditate on our brokenness in comparison with God's holiness. And then after we do so, we can and should remind ourselves that God's redemptive work in Jesus is the only thing that can mend us back together again. When we look at our brokenness and we are reminded that nothing we do can save us, our only hope is relying upon Jesus. Well, that should be truly humbling. And if we'll grasp that truth, if we'll meditate on that truth, it ought to cause us in everything we do to seek after God's glory. Nehemiah, even before the redemptive work of Christ, understood understood giving God glory. So when he accomplished a tremendous feat of rebuilding the wall in just 52 days of construction, there was no fanfare. There was no party for Nehemiah. He simply recorded, so the wall was finished. And everyone knew, even his enemies, that it was finished with the help of God. You see, Nehemiah wasn't blinded by his own ego. He did not let his success blind him from seeing that there was more work to be done. In fact, immediately after recording that the wall was finished and that his enemies were afraid, Nehemiah recorded that the enemies, however, had not gone away. Tobiah is mentioned again in verses 17 and 18. Tobiah is still sending letters to make Nehemiah afraid. And I think Nehemiah likely understood in those moments what we need to understand. That leaders trim their egos. And they do not live off past successes for there is more work to be done. They can perhaps take a moment to pat themselves on the back. But only a moment. Because they've got work to do. If they've been humble and given God the glory, he's got more he wants us to do. I have an ego to deal with. My dear wife, of course, experiences my arrogance more than, than anyone else does, but some of you have seen it rise up as well. But one of the things that keeps me humble is preaching. Because no matter how good you might tell me this sermon is, at most I've got this afternoon to bask in those compliments. Because come Monday morning, I've got to go right back at it. I've got to start preparing for another message. And honestly, next Sunday, you don't care how good this Sunday's message was. And fortunate for me, well, you often also don't remember how bad it was. 
But here's the bottom line for us, folks. Here's what I want you to, to take with you today. Leaders, don't be blinded by your success. Give God all the glory and then go right back at it. He's got work for you to do. Let's pray together. Lord, Nehemiah seemed to understand that you are holy and we are not. Therefore, he did not seek glory. He gave it to you instead. Father, help us to do likewise. May we lead in such a way that people see you. May we lead in such a way that even our enemies can't help but see your mighty hand at work. Oh Lord, make us your humble servants. When we are successful, may you receive the glory. I pray we'll enjoy our successes and we'll recognize your work in those successes. But then, Lord, help us get back at it and keep serving you all our days. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, today and forevermore. Amen. God bless you, church.